Good morning. My name is Henrik Peterson and I am the Group Commercial Director of Adlon Allen and thank you for joining us today for the True Cost of a Spill webinar. The purpose of the webinar today is to highlight the environmental, legal and reputational implications a spill can have on an organisation. Most of you will recognise the Adlon Allen name in the context of environmental risk reduction and our work supporting our customers in the event of a spill. We are increasingly seeing a regulatory focus on spill events, and in this context, we have over the years developed a relationship with Bertus Salmon to also ensure that our customers are supported by the best of legal and regulatory knowledge. I hope that you will find today's webinar a useful insight for your organization. I'll now hand over to our host today, Jen Patterson from Atlanta. Thank you, Henrik. Um, so I've just got a couple of housekeeping points um, to run through with you before we start. So if you have any questions for the presenters today, feel free to ask these in the Q&A box on the right hand side of the live event. We'll do our best to get through as many of these as we can in the time that we have and any that don't get answered will be followed up after the live event. Let me first quickly introduce our speakers today and outline what they will cover. We've got Simon Tilling, who is Head of Environmental Law at leading UK law firm Burgess Salmon. A graduate chemist before training as a lawyer, Simon has been advising on complex environmental issues for public and private sector clients for over 15 years. His practice includes environmental risks in transactions, regulatory investigations, incident response and environmental litigation. Simon will outline the environmental laws imposed on site operators, which in the event of a spill can result in legal proceedings, fines and reputational damage. Chris Ramsbottom is Head of Operational and Technical Support in Adler and Allen's Consultancy Services Division, where he's worked since 2012. He has 18 years experience as an environmental professional, helping customers protect their businesses and environment through managing pollution incidents, property transactions, construction activity and site operations. Chris will look at the impact of some example spill incidents and outline what you can do to protect your business as well as the environment. So let me now hand over to Chris to set the scene. Chris. Thank you, Jen. Uh, good morning, everybody. I wanted to start with the answer, uh, essentially, uh, which is the two costs of spills are environmental damage, probably a given, financial losses and reputational damage. Uh, it's immensely hard to recover from any of these, uh, prob probably reputation hardest of all. Uh, this is one of my favourite quotes that I've, I've put up there, and I think it's really pertinent to the to the content of this uh, of this presentation. So let's get into things in a little bit more detail. Incidents have consequences, and these are driven by the nature of the incident, where the incident happens, really fundamental point about the context, who finds out about it, how the incident is managed, how prepared you are and actually what matters to stakeholders. And really what we're talking about here today is, is environmental risk. So incidents create liabilities, create risk, and those risks really have to be managed. I wanted to throw up a few words um, just to show some of the consequences of mismanaged risks. Uh, key point to make, I think, is we'll make a recording of this presentation available afterwards. Uh, so you'll be able to look at this at your own leisure. I'm not going to read through it all, you'd be pleased to know. Um, again, there's a whole range of risks there. And it really matters though, who is the stakeholder, as I said, and here is a, an example, here are a few, here's a list of a few people there. Uh, I also wanted to throw up the key UK regulators and agencies because they are key stakeholders in any incident. And a final point on this, we are here today to talk about incidents, but I just want to note that environmental risk can arise in a, in a wide range of ways. Uh, some examples here on this slide. But the key points I think from today's webinar are just as relevant here as they are to um, incidents. So let's look at a few examples of some impacts. Uh, here we have a loss of oil on a major road, 27,000 litres uh, spilled out of an overturned tanker, got into the drains, escaped into the environment. You can see the road is completely shut down um, and there's 15 kilometres of water courses impacted. So there was an intensive scaled response just to get that road cleaned up, uh, get that road open. Great, that happened within a few hours. Really good work there. Took months for the environmental cleanup to happen. So there's some big impacts there. 
paint spillage. Uh, it doesn't take a lot of paint to make a bit of a mess, as you can see here. And so you might think, OK, it's a couple of parking bays, there's a little bit of the yard, not too much of a problem. I'd probably tend to agree with that. It's a health and safety hazard, a little bit of business disruption, it's manageable. You can get that stuff cleaned up quite quickly, but it is quite intensive. Um, what happens when the landlord though turns up the following week to do an inspection and says, hang on a second, I didn't put all this paint in here. So it could get a little bit costly. There's some extra complications there. And something like paint, you've got waste disposal to think about as well. Another example, uh, here's some liquid mercury. And you can see it doesn't look like a lot, but actually it's really toxic stuff. So you have to clear the area if we can do anything about it. So you're probably going to suffer some quite significant business disruption uh, whilst you're dealing with that, that incident. And it takes pretty specialist and unfortunately relatively costly uh, uh, cleanup to get rid of that problem. Here's another example. You've got some domestic uh, domestic setting, 100 litres of kerosene on this example, leaked from a boiler into a subsoil, into the subsoil below the property. So what happened was, was the, the kerosene moved around the soil, gave off vapours, went into the property. The entire property in this case was affected with hazardous vapours. The homeowners had to be evacuated into temporary accommodation. And then we get into the whole process of investigation, remediation, etc, etc. Uh, the whole thing took seven months to fix and, you know, a really quite significant cost there. And you can imagine looking at the, the image on the bottom right uh, of, of the screen, you know, walking in your front door and seeing that in your house. It's, it's not a thing that you want to be looking at. Here's another example, a chemical incident. Uh, this time you can see there's a the yellow stuff there is actually a, a cloud of chlorine gas that was created. Um, what we did was level one, a telephone advice given instantly, uh, got to site level two response to help. And there's a quite a decent area impacted, 11,000 square meters. And, you know, the common unit of measurement is a football pitch. That's about one and a half football pitches. Uh, thankfully, no serious personal injuries, but everything the gas touched was damaged in some way. And what you can see here is the spread of the gas cloud that went over a river, it went onto a third party property. And just a quick example on the river, you can see where the vegetation has been killed off by the gas cloud. So really quite, quite significant impacts here. Uh, HSE investigation. So a lot of business disruption now, a lot of cost and actually reputationally a uh, significant amount of damage. Final example I wanted to show was this. It's a spillage of oil into a river. So if you're still on the riverbank, you can't you can't see that. You can't see that oil slick. But if you go up uh, in the air, then you can see that that impact is actually quite extensive. And on this particular instance, as a public drinking water supply abstraction point really close to that uh, point of loss. So there's, there's another receptor there to think about. So quite costly and large scale incident response and cleanup needed uh, on the land. But long term, you're looking at environmental uh, long term environmental monitoring to check the water quality for impacts. Final point I want to make about setting the scene, uh, just a few stats on the substances and the causations that we're talking about here. So this is based on roughly 2000 incidents uh, for the last period of time and roughly three quarters of what we deal with is fuel oil. You can see there and average volume over 2000 litres. A lot of that's to do with crossover incidents where you're mixing uh, different fuels in a big storage tank. Uh, in terms of causations, roughly one third is error, roughly one third is due to infrastructure problems, maybe your tank is split, things like this. Roughly a quarter is a vehicle problem, let's say there's a leak of hydraulic oil from a delivery vehicle. But actually if you unpick all of those things, then almost three quarters of the causation is essentially down to human error, whether it's lack of uh, lack of inspection regime, lack of maintenance, something, something, something. OK, so causation, I hope, brings me quite neatly to Simon to talk about this. Thank you, Chris, and thank you to Adler and Alan for having me along for this webinar today. Uh, I'm a lawyer, so often uh, my phone is ringing because there is a spill or an incident. There's been some problem uh, and I'm dealing with the sharp end of trying to uh, mitigate those legal risks. And what I hope to do today is share some of my learning and knowledge from that uh, with you. You'll be glad to know, those of you who are doing a lot of homeschooling, this is not a, a lesson in environmental law. I want to make it very practical, not a lecture. But I think it really is important that you understand the shape of the environmental legal framework. 
that we all operate in because that does have some really important repercussions uh, and it will hopefully um, shape the way that you address and mitigate these uh, these risks. I want to make some broad points about the environmental uh, legal regime. Uh, I want to make the point that uh, environmental law itself is broad. Uh, we think about regulatory action and the criminal law and regulatory sanctions. Uh, let's not forget civil liability, contractual liabilities as well. Uh, environmental law has teeth. We're going to look at the uh, increase in fines and the wide range of sanctions uh, that exist in the event of spills or environmental incidents. But importantly as well, environmental law in its execution is a matter of discretion and judgment and businesses will be judged uh, by the courts, by the regulators uh, on their culpability as well as on the harm the incident has caused. Uh, and therefore there is a real role for good uh, both preventative measures, but good systems. So if accidents do happen, um, they, uh, there's a good demonstrable evidence base to say you were doing the right thing. So that brings me on to the, the, the messages that really flow throughout this. Prevention is better than cure, of course, and good systems in place are a very important part of that. But we've got to hope for the best, but plan for the worst. Pollution incident response plans are very important. And if you have an understanding, hopefully from this session of uh, the legal framework in its broad sense and the risk mitigation options available to you, that will help you structure uh, the way you do business and hopefully prevent some of the more severe uh, effects of, uh, of a spill from a legal perspective. I'd like to um, throw out some uh, true or false questions. You'll be glad to know that uh, it, this isn't audience participation. My knowledge of the technology isn't good enough to ask you to raise hands or anything, but have a look at those questions and your response to them. No doubt a lot of you will get this right. We'll revisit it at the end, but these are things that sometimes you do hear uh, assumptions being made that aren't quite uh, 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 as completely true as you might think. So have a look at those, have a think about that, and we'll come back and look at that after my session. We start really with what is pollution, by which I really mean, when does a spill create some sort of uh, liability? Uh, and the point I want to make with this slide with numerous different phrases on it, is that actually the thresholds and the liabilities that are created uh, really depends on the legal regime you're in. And there are lots of environmental law regimes. We have uh, environmental permitting uh, and water quality law before permitting came through, which looked at harm caused by the introduction of poisonous, noxious or polluting uh, matter uh, into the watercourse, for example. Uh, actually, the courts have, have um, interpreted that very widely. Uh, it's really things that shouldn't be there that could cause harm to the environment. And we've seen uh, all sorts of uh, items litigated milk, which of course we as human beings drink uh, in the wrong environment in the watercourse, highly polluting matter. We've had litigation over silt and soil because that's uh, suspended solids in water that has a, uh, a an impact. We've seen uh, litigation over visual pollutants. Titanium dioxide was a case I was once dealing with. Uh, a whitening substance used in toothpaste and other places uh, in a watercourse it had a visual polluting effect that's a pollutant environmental damage that has a meaning within uh, the environmental damage regulations we'll touch upon that at the end that's actually a higher threshold but with really severe consequences if you went there from the control of major accident hazards regime we get a major accident to the environment another threshold again another regime uh, significant possibility of significant harm from the contaminated land regime. You'll see these are all different thresholds set by different criteria, all of them bringing with them legal liability. The point I think is that a spill in the environment will have some degree of legal repercussions. So you have to understand what those might be uh, and get a, grip of, uh, get a grip on it as we'll talk through as we go through. Um, just finishing with uh, some phrases like environmental harm and contamination. How do these regulatory standards match up to your contractual standards? Uh, we've had a case where um, it was a multi-million pound piece of litigation around whether or not asbestos containing materials on land is contamination of land and whether it's contaminated land within the contractual sense actually made a multi-million pound difference to a particular contract. So really big decisions made on these uh, thresholds and descriptions we've got. So bear that in mind. But fundamentally, if there's a spill and pollution in what we call pollution, 
you're probably hitting some or more of these regimes. So what are these regimes? And I'm not going to go through all of them. I hope you've taken the point that there are numerous different regimes, but there's a thread. There's a sort of commonality between these regimes. And that's because the way that the UK operates is to criminalise harm to the environment, however you draw that threshold, and then have a permitting system which says those businesses that will cause an impact on the environment need a permit. And if you don't have your permit in place, and if you're not in, uh, in accordance with the conditions of your permit, it will be a criminal offence. So of course, when you have a spillage into water, for example, that won't have been permitted because it's an accident. That takes you into a criminal regime. Some from other jurisdictions would say that seems pretty harsh to criminalise. But actually the safeguard we have is that criminal offences are only prosecuted if it's in the public interest. So a well-run site did the right things, had a minor spill. Hopefully that's not in the range of prosecution because it's not in the public interest. But in terms of the law, it is a criminal regime. And we have this offences which are strict liability and that's lawyer speak for you don't need to prove fault. You don't need to prove anybody intended to harm the environment or was negligent in harming the environment. The fact that the harm happened uh, from the materials you were storing or transporting or whatever the situation might be is enough to get you evidentially to the threshold of an offence. And, and that's important. And that's been pushed again by the court in a very wide sense. So we've seen cases going back many years now where um, uh, vandals coming onto a site and turning the taps on of an oil storage tank. And it's, of course, the vandals turning it on that caused the oil to escape. It was nevertheless the company that had the oil storage that had committed the criminal offence because it was they had created the state of affairs whereby these unlocked taps could be opened by vandals and cause the environmental harm. So it's a wide system. There is, of course, um, this phrase or there is a phrase cause or knowingly permit. Causation we've talked about, that's very, very wide. Knowingly permit is where you don't do anything, you omit to do something. Uh, but nevertheless, you have knowledge, which means you can also be liable. So if you know you could do something and you don't, that can get you into the knowingly permitting uh, territory. Question that often arises is, do I have a duty to report uh, a spill? That depends on the legal framework you're in. It depends on the degree of harm. If you get to a degree of harm that has a that has such a um, an impact as to be what we call environmental damage, and there's a legal obligation to report, even if there's an imminent uh, threat you'd have to report in those circumstances. But the bottom line here is that actually regulatory engagement, dealing with your regulators, I know Chris will touch upon this uh, further in, in this session, is really, really important. How the regulators see you is so important that it may be the right thing to do, uh, the most prudent thing to do from a liability perspective to report uh, in any event. So, that, so the point is, yes, there are legal obligations to report, but you should always be thinking about it uh, from a risk mitigation perspective anyway. A lot of businesses are run by corporates. And of course, if if it's the business the corp that, that, that causes the incident, it will be the corporate that's the defendant. But that's not a way for uh, the more egregious offenders to hide behind corporate structures, because if it if a, if an if a, if a offence happens with the consent, connivance or neglect of a director or officer, there's also potential for personal liability. And a point on insurance, a very important risk mitigation uh, uh, mechanism insurance, uh, but they they won't uh, often uh, insure for uh, the criminal fines. It's against public policy. Um, so those fines are, are broadly uninsurable. And so you can't just mitigate entirely any financial risk from the legal repercussions through insurance policies. So I want to start with sanctions. Or I want to move on to sanctions and I want to start with the the, the, the worst case, which is a prosecution. It's a criminal regime, as we've discussed. So ultimately, uh, if it's in the public interest to do so, you can end up in court uh, in the usual sense. And I hope by that I mean, nobody hopefully is used to going to court. But we all see the criminal uh, system. You end up in front of magistrates uh, or, or in front of a Crown Court judge. You're either found guilty or you plead guilty and you get a sentence. And most often for environmental offences, that will be a fine. Uh, and when I first started practicing, that was really quite variable, which we used to like to chalk up to our skill as advocates in persuading the court to do a low fine. But in truth, uh, the, a lot of the courts just didn't know. They didn't see that many environmental offences. They didn't know where to set these fines. 
So we had uh, about five years ago or so a sentencing guideline for all the courts who are sentencing environmental offences that say this is how you uh, you sentence. It's a 12 step plan. I'm not going to walk through all of it, but I do want to make a couple of points. There are the first step is should there be a compensation order? Should the court order you to pay somebody else who's been harmed by your your spill? So the court can order you to make compensation to others. The court can confiscate the proceeds of crime that have been won through failing to comply with the legal regimes that would have prevented the spill. So to put you back where you should have been if you'd have actually spent money on uh, investing in uh, infrastructure and putting the right management systems in place. Confiscation orders rarely used, they're more, they're more in the waste sector, but they are there and important. And then it comes to fixing this level of fine and the courts look at predominantly three things. Culpability, how you've behaved, the harm, what's happened with the actual spill, where it's got to in the environment and the turnover of your business. And the turnover of the business is there to say, look, we want to send a message to the shareholders. So if your turnover is high, the fine must be proportionate to that. And you'll see uh, if you look at the chart. Now, this is a chart that's uh, a 2016 fine. But the really important thing I want you to take from this uh, is the sudden spike when the sentencing guideline came in. So this wasn't just about consistency. This was also about taking environmental fines up so that they, they trebled and broadly um, you know, continued to, uh, to, to, to grow from there. Um, so that environmental fines do send their messages to these shareholders. And in the bottom right hand corner there, you can see the 20 million pound fine, which was the record from uh, which was reached last year. And also conviction shouldn't be taken lightly for all sorts of other reasons, not least because they're often disclosable in public contracts. So it can have effect when you're bidding for uh, other work when it has to be disclosed. So ultimately you want to be out of the criminal court if you can, of course. Which brings me on to civil sanctions, which are a really important tool and they were brought in about a decade ago and they fill the gap between um, a prosecution, which is a pretty severe uh, outcome uh, and just a ticking off or a caution or a warning notice or a slap on the wrist um, to make sure that there was something in between this is what's called this compliance deficit. Um, there's a range of sanctions that the regulators can deal with without having to go to the courts. And they can be notices like enforcement notices or stop notices. They can be FET financial penalties, fixed or variable monetary penalties, uh, which all sound like the sort of thing you'd expect. The really interesting one, if you've not come across it already, are enforcement undertakings. And these are, these are actually not really imposed by regulators. What these are, is an operator that's had a spill or a, an incident can say, look, we know we this went wrong. We want to take responsibility and make uh, amends. Um, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to compensate. This is how we're going to remediate the environment. This is how we're going to make sure this doesn't happen again. And if the if the regulator is satisfied with that, that is instead of any sanction from the regulator. So they take the undertaking, which you then obviously have to comply with, importantly, backed up by the criminal law. But you, uh, it does provide a really important mechanism. Uh, and I used to say years before uh, Dominic Cummings claimed the phrase, this was a really good way of taking back control. When you've had a, a spill, when you've had an incident, you're under investigation, you've got civil claims, you've got the cost of remediation. Actually, this is a great way of saying that we've got control of this. This is what we're doing. And it removes, if it's accepted, this threat of uh, regulatory sanction. So that's really important. I also want to mention civil liability. I did promise this will not be a legal lecture uh, and it won't be, even though I have ca a case name there, which will scare uh, many people, including the lawyers on the call. Um, I'm, all I really want to demonstrate by this is that there are a number of routes for um, those who are harmed by an activity, uh, third parties who are harmed, to bring a legal claim um, through the courts for compensation for um, for, for recovery of their losses. Um, and that can also happen in parallel to the regulatory investigations and can really make it a very difficult position to be in. And then the final point on the legal framework is restoring environmental harm. Uh, often you want to do it voluntarily. If you've done an enforcement undertaking, you're going to be offering to restore uh, environmental harm. But there is also this legal regime, which I mentioned at the start, the environmental damage regulations, which if the threshold of harm is reached for these, 
Um, actually, it kicks in and it has a mandatory restoration uh, program. It's quite interesting in the way it operates. Um, in so far as not only do you have to look at making sure that the primary re remediation or restoration is done, so you know the water course gets back to health, uh, you've got to look at compensatory re restoration. So where a water course was degraded for a year while it's naturally brought back up to health, you've got to do something more to compensate for that natural capital, that ecosystem services that we've lost on a temporary basis while the restoration was happening. So you've got to go over and above, just bring it back to baseline to make it uh, on a time basis uh, the same places where you started. And if you can't bring it back, you also have to look at complementary restoration, bringing other sites up to make up for the fact that we've lost uh, ecosystem services. You know, we've lost some of the natural capital of what we had uh, from this site. And this natural capital thinking is really working its way into lots of other things like enforcement undertakings, other restoration work. So it's not just simply I've spilt it in the river, give it some time, it will get back to health. There are other obligations that can be uh, important to think about on restoration. So let me move on or back to uh, my myth busters. Um, true or false, I'm sure you've all scored very highly. Uh, insurance will cover it. Um, to a certain extent, a very important risk mitigation tool. But remember the point about criminal fines. A company limited structure is a very sensible way of organising a business, but it doesn't uh, provide a complete shield for the more egregious behaviour that we uh, you know, occasionally do see for environmental harm. Uh, we shouldn't just be thinking about hazardous products, things that are actually you know, have uh, on a cost assessment or a CLP labelling um, hazard symbols on it. Uh, things we drink, things we deal with every day can be hazardous in the wrong environment and will be pollution. This is not a fault based system. Uh, you will be liable on a strict liability. But what happens then is uh, depends a lot on your culpability. And what's done is done. We can't repair it now. Actually, a lot of the mechanisms now are looking to go over and above to bring it right back to the status it would have been uh, before the harm was committed. So my takeaway messages. Accidents do happen. Um, clearly prevention is better than cure. Having a good management system hopefully prevents it, but if it doesn't prevent it, it's really good evidence to say our culpability is low. We're a responsible business. We took the right state, the steps. Hope for the best, but plan for the worst. You have to, you have to if you're dealing with uh, substances in any quantities, uh, have to have a, a good pollution incident response plan. And we'll, Chris will talk about that. And do look at spreading the risk with contractual allocation of risk and role of insurance, contractual agreements, all very important uh, in terms of uh, spreading that risk. But you can't completely alleviate the risks through those mechanisms. And a final point, just because I can't um, do a webinar without mentioning the environment bill before Parliament at the moment, which will give us a new uh, environmental governance regime for the UK. Um, is that going to make everything really soft and easy for us? Uh, I doubt it. Uh, if you look at the manifesto commitment, it's a commitment to delivering the most ambitious environmental programme of any country on Earth. We could have a whole other webinar on talking about that. But the reality is, uh, I don't think the change of system will mean any particular alleviation of these uh, these environmental controls that we've got to date. And I hand back to Chris. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. So let's look a little bit now at what sorts of things we can do to help manage that environmental risk that we've been talking about. And what I want to start with is what not to do. Don't panic. Uh, don't tackle incidents unless you have the appropriate training and resources. Don't try and wash the stuff down the drain. OK, ignoring it, delaying it, covering it up. That's going to end probably badly for you. So let's just face up to it and, and, and tackle it in a positive way. So let's look at how uh, you can protect yourself. Uh, Simon brought this up earlier. Environmental management system is cornerstone, really, of the sorts of things that you should be doing to manage your, your risk due to spills. Uh, part of that and overlapping with that is the training element. We can do things like establishing a baseline, I'll touch on that in a minute. The pollution incident response planning, really important part of uh, what, you, what you're doing. The pollution control hierarchy is actually forms part of understanding what that pollution incident response planning is. You can look at some dedicated support and then you can look at what you do beyond that environmental risk assessment 
Um, I wanted to highlight specifically the importance of authority relationships. And it's not at the end because it's the least important. It kind of underpins everything that, that we're talking about here. So it's really a, it's a really important bookend on everything we're going to we're going to say. Let's start with the environmental management system. Uh, again, I'm not going to labour this point. Uh, I'm not going to read out all these words. Um, what I really want to focus on is it start. You start with the organisation's environmental policy, and really, it's it's there to uh, manage and enhance the environmental performance of what you're doing. The key things I want to draw out in this presentation are things on the staff training and emergency response procedures. I'm just looking very quickly at a couple of scenarios. Let's say you're a business who delivers oil to domestic or storage tanks. And this picture is a real example. It's actually in Northern Ireland where they don't have a history of, uh, of a gas network particularly. Um, so a lot of how they heat and power their homes is, uh, is on site, oil, et cetera, et cetera. But before any delivery could be made to these tanks, you need to think about driver training and competence, about inspection and maintenance of delivery vehicles and the equipment. You need to make sure that you've got the correct details for the customer and how much fuel they want. And you need to think about how you're going to do your on-site checks. You know, have you got safe access to the tank? What is the tank in a good enough condition to deliver to? Uh, what's the ullage? Have I got enough space in the tank that I can put the order into? So all of these things are driven by your environmental management system before you've even made a delivery. Another example, let's say you just all you want to do is build an office block. So you happily go to site, start digging a hole and you come across this sort of stuff in the ground. So that presents some immediate issues on site, vapour, dust, runoff, groundwater control, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but actually before all of that, where's your due diligence? Have you done your investigation? Have you found out about the site before that? So all of these things really stem from the environmental management system that you should have in place. We can look at training next, uh, which is really, really important for your workforce to support the roles and responsibilities that uh, all your colleagues have. For example, maybe some spill kit use for site managers and operatives. I believe that all staff should have some form of environmental awareness training, uh, but really needs to be tailored for their role. And here in the background, you can see uh, we've got a team of people doing a, an exercise in a, in a marine setting just to prepare in case there is a spill incident. So they know what to do, they know where to go, and they can respond to that really, really quite well. We can also talk about establishing a baseline. And what this is, is really making sure that you know the condition of the environment you're operating in before you start the operation. And there's a slight asterisk here, which is where possible. Because if you're going to deliver oil to a tank in someone's home, you can't really do a baseline. OK, but remember here, the key point with the environmental damage regulations would be, for example, the primary restoration. It's quite a, it's a, it's a high threshold to get there, but once you get there, it's quite severe. So if you know what, what the quality, you know, the condition of where you're operating before you start, if there is an incident, you know where you can get back to. How to do that? You collect good data, use some specialists for that. Uh, you can do things like regular monitoring. So let's say you're a business and you have some drainage and uh, you're, you might discharge your surface water to a river next to your site. Let's measure what the quality of the baseline is. Let's measure periodically the quality of your discharge. And as the graph shows, OK, you start off with the baseline. Great. Quarter one looking good. Quarter two, hang on a sec, there could be a problem because there's a big spike. So if you do any monitoring, and you see that, take some action, find out what's going on. And this is all to demonstrate good environmental management. The Pollution Incident Response Plan is another really fundamental uh, part of what we can do to manage environmental risks. Uh, again, I'm not here to read out all the words on the slides. Uh, all these things that you can see are really important key parts of the plan. Uh, one of the one of the most key points in in my opinion, really pragmatically, would be something like the drainage plan. There's a extract on the right hand side. You can see surface water drains marked up in blue, foul water drains marked up in red. And I think what's really good is you have a plan and you can highlight one chamber where it's almost your silver bullet. So let's say there's a spill on this particular site and you think, well, what can I do to protect the site really quickly? I have to respond quickly. Let's go to that drain, let's block it, let's shut it off, let's do whatever we need to do to make sure that nothing gets beyond that drain. So you can do that. And to emphasise the point about spill kits, uh, there can be quite a choice and here are a few examples. 
And the point about spill kits is making sure that what you have to hand on your site is appropriate for your activity. There's all different colours, different materials, different techniques. Uh, you just need to make sure that what you've got is going to work for you and then that, that will really support your pollution incident response planning. Which brings me on to the pollution control hierarchy. And this is really important because the pollution control is needed to prevent further impact. And the hierarchy of containment essentially is the closer to the source of pollution that you can that you can contain something, the better. OK, uh, and there's a hierarchy there. One, two, three, four, five, starting at the source and ending up uh, uh, worst case in the wider environment. What you're trying to do is have really good speed and scope of notification and really good speed and scope of response if there's an incident. So the scope of notification would be something like if you need to call in a specialist, pick up the phone, tell them what you're dealing with, tell them it's a thousand litres if that's what the spillage is, don't say it's a hundred litres because then the, when the responders come they are properly prepared to respond in, in, in a good way. And I often present it in this way. And I'm, what I'm not saying, for example, that it's always £12,000 to contain something on the ground surface. I'm trying to show an escalation. And um, with increasing delay, you can get escalation. So quickly, in case anyone is not certain, let's look at some examples of this. Pollution control hierarchy at the source. OK, we've got an oil drum here. Uh, it's leaking, we sealed it with putty. So OK, there's some impact on the floor, but whatever is left in the drum is contained within the drum. So that's what that is doing right there. When you look at something that's close to the source, here we have some containers, some IBC, some oil drums, things like this, and we've got some drip trays. So if something's going to be leaking out of, of those containers, it goes in the drip trays, it's contained pretty close to the source. Uh, on the ground surface here, you can see this is a, actually was a loss of liquid nitrogen. And in the distance, you might be able to make out a pond. Uh, it's a quite sensitive receptor. So what happens? OK, halfway down the road, we put good old soil, good old hay and some chemical absorbance there. And that's really preventing that liquid nitrogen going any further. In the drains, uh, this is an example of some crude oil. And the reason why it's moving is because we're actually sucking it out of the, of the far end. So we're actually removing that oil. But what you can say, I hope, is that the crude oil has been contained within that drain um, and it's not spread out any further. And the final one is in the environment, and this is the least preferable condition because the pollutant is, is out there. Uh, so that picture in the middle is a water is a water course. It doesn't look in great condition, but you still have to protect that water course with the same degree of attention as you have to do with something, let's say, on the right hand side. Here you can see some absorbent uh, pillows and some booms and things like this. Another example of pollution control in the environment would be something like this cutoff trench. So on this particular example, we've got oil flowing through the soil uh, at shallow depth. And the idea of the trench is, is that the oil flows into the trench and not further downhill. So here you can see the gas oil on this occasion is collected there. And this is really good for us because not only can we prevent the spread of oil, we can actually recover that oil out of the environment quite readily. And here we're just using a vacuum tanker to suck it up. I think this concept of dedicated support is really important. Um, hopefully what we've been able to show throughout is there are a range of conditions, a uh, range of contexts, range of things that you can do when there's an incident. OK, so having that expertise is really, really important. Um, you get that depth of resource as well to make sure that if there is something going on, you can come and deal with it in a, in a really uh, good way. And the outcome really that you're looking for is protecting your environment, protecting your business and protecting your reputation. I touched a little bit on that last slide about environmental risk assessment, and this is really the next step. If we have a, an incident, if you have a spill, OK, let's let's get on it. Let's hit it hard. Let's do a comprehensive cleanup. Let's make it safe. Great. We've done that job really well. But what happens if you don't know the full extent of that impact? So you need to make sure that you carry out some form of risk assessment to make sure that you've got some appropriate protection measures. OK, and I think the really key fundamental thing I want to highlight is this concept of the source pathway receptor pollutant linkage. I'm sure a lot of you will have, will have heard this before, but it is really one of the fundamental things in environmental risk assessment. It's well worth highlighting. There has to be a source of pollution, there has to be a receptor, something that could be harmed by that pollution, and there has to be a pathway between the two. If you get those three things together, you create a linkage, 
and that carries some form of risk. And this is the, the, the key thing that we would assess. Just to give you a quick example of that, here we've got an all storage depot, quite a nice setting. And you think the tanks look great, in good condition, you know, probably not a lot going to go wrong there. I tend to agree, but actually this whole facility exists in the first place because you need to transfer that oil to the customer who needs to use it in their home. So you've got to load your delivery vehicles that potentially that is the point that, that might be a problem. You might have a spillage of fuel whilst you're loading your vehicles. OK, you think it's an old depot, it's all good. Actually, on this particular occasion, there's a drain straight from the depot into the sea. So if there's an incident, you know, you could have some quite major consequences there. Environmental risk assessment, I uh, don't want to labour the point. Essentially, it's a process of data collection in various different ways. And once you've collected your data, you build your conceptual model, you test in all, you put it in linkages, and if there's still something that out of if there's still something there that is unacceptable in terms of risk, then it's very likely you need to do some form of remediation or restoration. And finally, similarly to Simon earlier, there are dozens of bits of guidance and legislation on how to do this. Uh, I really just like to ask three questions. What is it? Where is it? Is it a problem? Because, because every site is different and should be judged on its own merits. So if there's a problem, you go to site, ask those three questions, and then you can get to a quite sensible answer. And the final point, really, really important, is the, is the authority relationships. At some point in this process that we've been talking about, authorities will need to get involved. And I'd always recommend getting them involved sooner rather than later, because we need to create good working relationships, work together to, to, to fix the problems that are at hand. So um, I hope that was a good overview and let's close on a few key points. Uh, spills can have a range of impacts. I hope we've been able to demonstrate that. A key factor is where it's the context, it's the setting. It's not necessarily what the spill involves, the type of fuel, the quantity, where the spill happens is massively, massively important. And, and I think we've been able to demonstrate the true costs are environmental damage, financial losses, and reputational damage. So how can you protect your business as well as your environment? Uh, plan, massively important. Be prepared, be proactive. But actually part of planning is having that plan B. So that if you do have a spill, don't panic. Put that plan into action, get help if you need it. What you're then, needing, what you're then aiming to do is contain and clean up those problems. And once you've done that, made the area safe, if, if you need to investigate for any longer term or hidden liabilities. So the final point is, is, is right there. The right supply with understanding of the law and technical capability will be able to de-risk your business, giving you peace of mind that you are as prepared as you can be for an environmental incident. I think I'd like to hand over to Jen for any questions. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, Simon. Um, so we've had a couple of questions come in. Um, the first one here by Oliver Harwood, probably a good one for you, Simon. Uh, he's interested in landowner liability when contamination by others. And uh, just before you answer that, if anyone else has any other questions that they'd um, like to raise, you can do that in the uh, Q&A box to the right hand side of the screen as well. Over to you, Simon. Thanks. Thank you, Jen, and thank you, uh, Oliver, for your question. Um, there's quite a lot, I think, in that short that short question that we might unpick. I mean, I let's just start by thinking about um, this May's webinar being about incidents and, 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 and spills. Uh, I had a case a couple of years ago uh, where the um, the spill was uh, uh, neighbouring land. It was actually uh, tenanted by a landowner on a on a larger parcel of land. The landowners in hand land included a watercourse that flew that that, that flowed down to join a, a larger river, and the spill was pretty much um, fairly and squarely the responsibility of the tenant and 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 uh, his operations. But the landowner couldn't simply throw their hands up and say, "Well, look, it's all it's all that." chap's fault and 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 um uh, uh and let's not worry about it 
Uh, the Environment Agency within England was on site. They were expecting action from the landowner who had control of the watercourse, who had control of some of the drainage near the watercourse. They were saying, well, this needs to be sorted and that needs to be sorted. And being quite frank, they were saying, well, if you just stick your hands in the air and let it all flow down to the main river and you have further uh, environmental degradation down in, in that river that has fish in it, etc., we're going to be looking at you too, because either you're causing it by not taking in and stopping it flowing through, or uh, it's knowingly permitting through knowing you could do it um, and yet not um, uh, not taking that sort of appropriate action. So this regime, um, just because somebody else is maybe at fault, doesn't mean that there is um, there's no liability for for, for landowners in, in those scenarios. Uh, your question could also be interpreted as around um, contamination by uh, previous events by neighbouring landowners, more historic contamination or slower migration. Um, and I'll do a shameless plug for our second webinar that talks about the importance of knowing your site. And I'm going to go into more of the regimes about um, the contaminated land and how uh, liability for cleaning up what's there uh, might come through. So a plug for that. But in, in short, um, uh, th there can also be liability. Yes, there may be ways to recover those costs from the person that was at fault. Uh, and there's, you know, I've been involved in lots of litigation around that. Uh, but yes, uh, I think landowners can have liability, even though that fault, that cause was others. Can I add to that? Yeah, go ahead. Perfect. So this is a scenario we, we deal with on a on an almost daily basis. Um, and I think the, one of the key points that we would make would be, uh, well, what is it? Where is it? Is it a problem? You know, always just get just go and get some data, go and investigate, go and see what the problem is. And then you then you're in a good position to work out what to do about it. Good stuff. Thanks, guys. Um, so I've got another question here um, that's come in um, about kerosene, spilled kerosene. Um, so are there any tests available on spilled kerosene that might indicate how long before the oil had likely spilled? Scenario is domestic third party alleging a spill, but insure, insurance had no knowledge of any loss of oil, no real evidence of causation, a number of other surrounding properties from which it could have originated, also relevant where a possible spill timeline might straddle a renewal date slash two different insurers. I'm not sure who might want to take, take that. that one. Thanks, Chris. No problem. Uh, in short, there are there are tests that you can do. Um, so if you go to site, do your investigations, collect some good data, you can collect uh, hopefully a sample of that of that oil and you can send it off to the lab and you can do do do, do some aging on it. And that can give you an estimate of the, the the age of that product. There are quite a lot of caveats, though. However, uh, within within that, um, in terms of degradation in the environment, uh, so uh, I actually wrote a paper on that last year, so I've got that available if anyone wants to see that. Um, I think probably the key point is to go and have a look and, and, and get eyes on it and, and and have a look for yourself, and you really use the specialist, use their professional judgment and their experience to. Uh, to, to, to make a call on this. Um, so yeah, in short, you can test for it, but there are caveats. So again, you just need to use you use your your judgment to work it out. Great, thanks, Chris. Um, do you want to add anything, Simon, to that one? Yeah, thanks, Jen. Um, obviously, uh, agree with uh, Chris. The, the point I think I'd like to um, add is um, we see this all the time in 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 when it gets to disputes. Um, whose whose pollution is it? There could be multiple sources, uh, and of course, evidence is 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 um, uh, what wins, what makes or breaks cases. Uh, and so, the, the 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 testing that is available to be able to identify whose responsibility it is, uh, where it came from, are, are very important. Um, but a, an important point to to just to just note in that context. Uh, criminal standard, whether you could be prosecuted for it, uh, requires uh, proof beyond all reasonable doubt. So you have to be absolutely clear it came from you and not others. So that's a very high threshold. But the civil courts, which is often where you see these matters litigated, who's responsible, which insurer should pick this up, that's ultimately balance of probabilities. A judge hears one argument and another argument. 
looks at the evidence, makes a judgment call on it. Um, and so actually uh, these, these things can be uh, hotly contested and, and, and heavily litigated uh, over, over a period of time. And these fingerprinting um, ability to try and identify uh, uh, where the actual oils or whatever the contaminant may be came from and trace it back through become pretty critical in those cases. And I think I'd, I'd add another point to that would be, say you're dealing with a situation where there's neighbouring properties and, and and maybe there are different different insurance policies involved, different loss adjusters, different different homeowners is obviously very different. I think it's really it's really good if you can in those circumstances to have one approach to it, to bring it together, to make sure it's all considered as a whole. Um, because once you start splitting things up into different bits and in different boxes, it starts to get a little bit, uh, a little bit complicated and potentially conflicted. So I'd, I'd encourage just a real simple approach as well on these uh, types of issues. Excellent. Thanks both for that one. We've got another one here that's come in. Um, so what responsibilities do an engineer have for checking a fuel storage tank whilst carrying out routine servicing? And what responsibilities does an oil delivery driver have for checking the suitability and condition of a tank before making a delivery? For example, a split um, seam to be rear of a tank that might not have been easily accessed slash seam due to surrounding vegetation. Yeah, take that. Um, with the scenario with regards to a, an oil delivery driver, it will be it will be driven by the environmental management system that the company has and what policy they put in place. Um, uh, so it'll be very much dependent on the individual company involved. But yeah, it's generally a good idea to make sure the tax in a good condition before you deliver. We, 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 we deal with quite a lot of incidents that are reported for information uh, only where someone goes to site, the driver goes to site, sees the condition of the tank. They know they've not made a delivery, so they can't be liable for anything there, but nevertheless still need to report it in just in case. Um, so we see that quite quite a lot. Uh, in terms of engineer checking things on site, uh, again, very similar uh, answer really. It depends on the environmental management policy, uh, system that you have in place and what your policies are. There are lots of different bits of guidance and legislation and codes of practice and things like this. And this particular uh, webinar is, is, it was not really the place to include all of that. Um, uh, perhaps we can follow that one up uh, at a later date, Jen, with uh, maybe a little bit more information. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, no problem at all. Okay, we've actually got quite a few questions coming in, so we'll just keep going um, yeah. for a little while and then um, we'll close off. But any that we don't, um, or we're not able to respond to, we'll um, make sure that we post answers out about those. Uh, so we've got another one here from Rob. What's your view on positioning and operation of site welfare on construction sites which require water connection, foul outlets? slash removal and storage of gases, fuels, etc. I'll take that. Chris? <clears throat> I think the key concept I would always have in mind would be the source pathway receptor pollutant linkage. Um, so we've presented today in the scenario of a spill, something's happened that you can come along and you can assess the impacts based on these things. But actually, uh, you can use the same principle to uh, predict uh, what could happen. And if you do that process, then you can make some changes uh, and put in some mitigation measures to, to, to manage those risks. Um, this will probably be something that we will cover in, in the next webinar on assets and asset protection and things like that. Um, I think there also needs to be a balance with, you know, the very pure sort of environmental risk assessment piece and actually what you need to do on site as well and, and, and your operations and, and making that optimum as well. So you can use that really key uh, technique to predict and plan where to place things, but always whatever you do has to work for your activity as well. Perfect. Thank you, Chris. Um, and then probably last one here, I think. Um, what would be best for controlling spills in a river if it's fast flowing river where booms, etc., could not be deployed? Probably one for you, Chris. Yeah. Um, if the river is that fast flowing, uh, as I suggested, you often you get it's 
it's not that dilution is the solution to pollution is that quite a, what, what a lot of people say but when the river is that fast flowing um the, the the stuff gets into the river and kind of it, it just gets spread out very very easily very quickly um gets broken up in the environment gets degraded sort of quite quite quickly so you often don't see uh, a huge impact when you've got a really fast flowing sort of torrent if you like um I guess come back to the point prevention is better than cure you know uh make sure you have systems and policies in place where you are minimizing your chances of spills uh often to add to that point often there's not a lot you can do in a fast flowing water course as well purely on a health and safety grounds because you can't send you know colleagues and, and people into into hazardous environments um so often you have to wait and see and let it subside and then deal with the impact then. Brilliant. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think we've probably got time for one more from Roger McCurley. Uh, if there is a spill on a construction site whilst a subcontractor is working, ground working, for example, who is liable, the principal contractor or the subcontractor? Maybe one for you, Simon. Wonderful question, Roger. Thank you. Um, well, I think to unpick that, I'm conscious we only have <laughs> uh, a minute or so left. Um, li liable, there's li liable in what way is the, would be my first question, because we need to distinguish who, who might be liable as a matter of regulatory criminal law uh, and who might be liable as a matter of, 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 of the contract. They can come out with two different answers depending on the, uh, on the contractual uh, structure. Um, the uh, the other point really is it's going to be very fact specific, but it's, it happens time and again. Um, the 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 subcontractor could um, could have bring in store and then accidentally release the um, uh, the material. Um, but if the uh, if the principal contractor hasn't put in place other mechanisms to make sure that that doesn't then get through drains and into the watercourse or whatever, uh, on a fact specific basis. Uh, a regulator investigating this will look and say uh, what is the cause here and if you remember back to the um, that case about the vandals more than one person can cause uh, an incident and so my expectation would be and in fact on numerous occasions uh, principal contractor and subcontractors will both be investigated if it's a serious incident it goes to interviews under caution etc they'll both be asked to be given accounts of uh, what happened to each other and it can get quite tetchy uh, within that contractual relationship and that's quite apart from then looking at the contract to work out who actually is going to bear the costs of the restoration, who's going to bear the costs of delays to the project etc. So lots of really interesting questions uh, to unpick in that Roger and I suppose the answer fundamentally is it could be both uh, and it very much depends on the facts. Thank you Simon. So I think that's all that we've got time for in terms of questions. Uh, there are some more on there, so any that haven't been responded to, we will uh, respond to those as well. Uh, so all that's left for me to do is to thank Simon, Chris and Henrik for their time today. And thank you for everyone for joining us as well. We hope it's been really valuable for you. A recording of the webinar will be shared with you this week. A few people have been asking me that. Uh, and if you have further questions, please feel free to contact Simon and Chris directly and their details are on the screen now. Uh, we'll be running another webinar in June, uh, which I think has been mentioned, on protecting the value of your investment by understanding the environmental risks on your site. So you can look out for emails and social media posts on that with sign up details. Uh, and we hope to see you there. So uh, that's it for today. Thank you very much and goodbye.